This is CBC Here and Now. It's a pure pleasure of having a, a huge canvas that I can explore. And explore he did. We'll introduce you to the man behind this sweet mural in St. John's. And now here's what's making news tonight. Today marks the start of the Muskrat Falls inquiry. But there's one thing missing. I find it very interesting that a forensic audit isn't in the terms of reference. But that could still happen. This has been the world's largest crab fishery for quite some time. But it's in dire shape. In the biggest areas, it looks uh, pretty bleak right now. Is there any hope? That's an open three for Carl English. Hits the three. The English edge, Carl nails the buzzer beater. Well, yes, winter is well underway in Labrador, and that theme generally continues this week. On the island, however, more mild air, more double digits, more rain. The details are coming up. We begin tonight with a violent robbery in Avondale. A business owner there is recovering after a thief attacked him in his home early Sunday morning. This small convenience store was the target of the robbery. Its owner, Rodney Anthony, was asleep in his home, which is attached to the store. At around four in the morning, a man wearing a ski mask broke in. Anthony heard the noise, and when he went to investigate, the robber attacked him in the hallway, hitting him and spraying a chemical into his eyes before stealing cigarettes and cash from the store. Anthony managed to call police, and an ambulance took him to the Health Sciences Center in St. John's. Anthony says he sore from being hit and kicked and his eye still hurts, but he should recover fully. He says it was a terrifying experience. I was in bed. I heard about three noises. Then I go up. And when I opened the bedroom door, he was there in the hallway. That when they, he sprayed me. And he hit me a couple of times. He sprayed me again and I fell down. Then went back out in the shop, came back and hit me again, and went on to the front door. I was pretty late. Oh, yeah. I wouldn't want go, anybody to go to it. Friends and family of Hannah Thorne gathered in a Harbor Grace courtroom today to address a man charged with causing her death. Brian Robert King has pleaded guilty to street racing and dangerous driving. For those closest to Thorne, including her grandmother, today was painful. Here now's Janelle Kelly has more. At least 30 of Hannah Thorne's friends and family were here today, most of them wearing purple, her favorite color, and wearing pins bearing the 18-year-old's photo. That is, until Judge Bruce Short ordered they be put away. They were here for the sentencing hearing of Brian King. The 32-year-old pleaded guilty earlier this fall to dangerous driving causing bodily harm and street racing causing death after the July 2016 crash that killed the teen and seriously injured her grandmother, Gertrude Thorne. Hannah was a passenger in her grandmother's car when it collided with King's Ford F-150 pickup. King was racing at the time. He'd been traveling at speeds of 130 kilometers an hour when he passed a vehicle on a solid line and struck Thorne's vehicle. Hannah died at the scene while her grandmother spent nine weeks in hospital recovering from her injuries. King cried as eight victim impact statements were read today from Hannah's parents, a cousin, her friends, and grandmother. Prosecutor Richard DeVoe delivered Gertrude Thorne's statement to the court, describing how horrifying it was for her to watch her granddaughter take her last breaths. She said she held Hannah's hand, even though she knew the teen was gone, and that the image of Hannah's blue fingers are something she'll never forget. King said he couldn't imagine what the Thorne family has endured and hopes his sentence brings some sort of justice and closure. Hannah's mother, Gail, chose not to listen to King's apology and left the courtroom. Hannah Thorne's parents said they were too upset to comment today, but friend Kylie Jackson says no amount of jail time will help ease their grief. I don't think any amount of time would compare to losing Hannah. It's just like after he gets out of jail, he can move on with the rest of his life, but Hannah's never coming back. DeVoe recommends that King serve a sentence of three and a half to four years in jail and be prohibited from driving for 10 years. The defense wants him to serve two to three years in jail and be prohibited from driving for two to five years. Judge Short will render his decision on December 12th. Reporting for Here and Now, I'm Janelle Kelly in Harbor Grace. 
We now know what form the inquiry into Muskrat Falls will take. It won't be fast. Justice Robert LeBlanc will have more than two years to look into how the project ended up years behind schedule and billions over budget. Here now is Peter Cowan is live in the newsroom with the details. So Peter, what will this inquiry look at? Well, Carolyn, the Premier said today he wants to give Justice LeBlanc as wide a mandate as possible to look at any and all parts of this project, but there are four key things that he's signaling for the Commissioner to do. So one of them is around how this project was sanctioned, the analysis whether this really is the lowest cost option in order to get power to the province. He's going to look at the execution of the project. Were the contracts managed properly? How did those costs end up exploding? And he's going to look at whether government was right to exclude the Public Utilities Board from oversight on the Muskrat Falls project. And the fourth thing is, has government done a proper job of overseeing Nalcor and the overall project in this case? So now, the commission is going to have that wide-ranging option. One thing that isn't mentioned in here is any of the specific environmental concerns. Indigenous people are going to be included in this, but not some of their concerns, and that's an issue for the NDP. So this report may not come out until after the next election. Peter, why is that? Well, that's really an interesting issue around timing. This is going to be sort of a month. Um, the, the deadline is December 31st, 2018, sorry, 19, and there has to be an election right before that. Uh, and so what it comes down to is the fact that this will then end up playing a big role in what people are talking about leading into the election, but you won't have that final report. And that's something that the PCs raised as a concern today. What I want to do is make sure that we restore the confidence in Newfoundlanders and Labradorians that we can actually do projects. We have the skill sets to do it. But we need to know is that the decisions that were made at the beginning, at sanction time of this project, indeed were they right? And what lessons did we learn along the way so that we prevent this from happening again in the future? So that's Premier Dwight Ball there talking about what he hopes to get out of this inquiry. Uh, one of the things that the commissioner will be able to do is hire outside expertise. So these are people like financial, uh, environmental, uh, structural engineers, people who can look at the analysis done and provide that second opinion. And that's going to allow them to be able to go in and uh, be able to cast some judgment when he puts together his report looking at exactly uh, how we got to this, pl this place. That's the uh, CBC's uh, Peter Cowan reporting live from our newsroom. Uh, my apologies for some of the uh, mistakes that we had there. So what does the Premier, former Premier, who pushed hard for this development think? Well, Danny Williams released a statement this afternoon, and in it he writes, I'm very pleased to see the inquiry into Muskrat Falls has finally been called. There has been so much negativity surrounding this project in recent years, and I completely appreciate the public's desire to see this inquiry proceed. It is my hope that not only will the project's alleged deficiencies be carefully examined, but also that we might see the positive aspects highlighted for a complete and balanced picture. Hi, Ryan. Hello. How are you? <laughs> Very are smooth. You? Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yes. It's a little harder for yeah. me to walk over briskly right. with this uh, boot on, yeah. but I did. Uh, the, uh, the, the agony of defeat. Yeah, right? that's right. Yeah. Uh, I've been no. saving that. Hey. That's good. I like perfect, that. Perfect, perfect. Uh, so, uh, as I've been saying, uh, I'm glad, at least with this boot on, and as I think many folks are just glad that winter's holding off in, on the island. Yes. Right. Not so much in Labrador. Have a look at this picture. Uh, this was actually taken in Happy Valley Goose Bay over the weekend before the rain. And in fact, Goose, Goose Bay in the southeast did see some rain uh, for, of course, uh, yesterday in uh, so a little more of a slushy mess than what you're seeing there than that beautiful white scene. Though Western Labrador is still a winter wonderland, and we'll show you some great video coming up. There's the low that is again our latest low moving off to the north. We've had that warm push of air, still looking at some rain here across the Avalon. Uh, that is slowly but surely starting to part. The latest radar image shows the last bit of rain just starting to clear away from St. John's. A couple of little spotty uh, periods of drizzle in there. That's about it for this evening. The West Coast, the story, 
Those onshore flurries and even a few snow squalls starting to fire up. That'll be the story if you do have some travel plans along the West Coast tonight and especially for you early morning commuters on uh, Tuesday. Watch your timeline here as we see some of those squalls starting to set up. So some very blustery conditions for the early morning hours of Tuesday. Winds gusting in the 50 kilometer per hour range. So certainly be prepared for the possibility of some whiteout conditions that could again uh, really kick up in a hurry as you drive. Uh, some very, very ch cool wind chills in uh, western parts of Labrador, by the way, to start your morning as well. Minus 14, the actual temperature, it will feel a lot cooler than that. And temperatures only getting up to around minus 10 for tomorrow for daytime highs. We'll have more on this story. And of course, so we'll walk you right through the next three days in full detail in just a few minutes. More tonight on a story we brought you on Friday about a former Crown prosecutor having a sexting or at least a fantasy relationship with a woman whose brother was accused of murder. The issue was raised last week by lawyer Bob Buckingham. Here now's Glenn Pett is on the story once again today. Glenn, just give us a recap as to who the players are in this. Well, viewers might remember back in 2011, Phil Penn was charged with a murder here in St. John's. He would eventually be convicted of manslaughter. Penn has a sister named Felicia, and it turns out that at the time of the killing, a Crown prosecutor, Nick Westra, was having perhaps a salacious texting relationship with her. Well, Westra was a Crown prosecutor in the office, and it was the Crown's responsibility for prosecution prosecuting Phil Penn. All right, now Glenn, this is over five years old. Why is this coming up now? Well, Wester's name came up as part of the investigation, and he was asked to come in and speak with the police. That interview was done under the direction of now Inspector Tom Warren, who was a sergeant at the time. On the stand at a trial in St. John's last week, lawyer Bob Buckingham asked Warren about the interview and how the situation was handled. He asked of Warren, did you learn in terms of this investigation that this matter had been brought to the attention of the Director of Public Prosecutions at the time? Warren replied, yes, it had. And Glenn, who was the director of public prosecutions then? It was Donovan Malloy, who is now the privacy commissioner for the province. In response to the CBC today, Malloy said, Mr. Buckingham is not acquainted with the facts. Appropriate measures were taken, and there are significant privacy limits on the ability of any public body to discuss workplace investigations. And what were the appropriate measures? Well, to use Buckingham's words, Westra was terminated. I remember at the time that Westra was escorted out of the office. In fact, a former legal aid lawyer I bumped into today reminded me of that. And we, are, and we asked the current Minister of Justice, Andrew Parsons, about Westra's behavior. I think that was uh, expressed in the, you know, in the fact that he is no longer with the Crown's office. Well, you mentioned Inspector Warren, who directed the interview with Wester in 2012. Why was Buckingham questioning if there was any kind of preferential treatment, Glenn? Well, during the interview, when Wester referred to Warren, he called him Tommy. Buckingham asked Warren if that seemed familiar. Now, Warren said, why Mr. Wester called me Tommy? I have no idea. And Buckingham asked Warren straight out, was there any special treatment given to Mr. Wester? Warren said, no, my lord. So what are the RNC saying now? I asked uh, for an interview with Inspector Warren and got this response. It would not be appropriate for Inspector Warren to speak to you on any specific interviews that may have been conducted during that investigation. Did Buckingham raise anything else? Certainly, there was one thing that jumps out. He raised the possibility that Westra may have been having similar relationships with other women caught up in the justice system. Warren responded, I can't recall if there were relationships with persons inside the court system directly, but learned that Mr. Westra had relations with other persons beside Miss Penn. Warren also said he had questions, suspicions of Westra's credibility. Now, is this the last that we're going to hear about this story? I really don't think, uh, think so, Anthony, and I just have to say this. We have to remember that Westra was not charged with anything and was right. never sanctioned by the Law Society. All right, appreciate that. The CBC's Glenn Payette. You're welcome. And now to the Brandon Phillips murder trial, where a firearms expert took to the stand. The court heard that under testing in a crime lab, the gun that police say was used to shoot Larry Wellman went off when it was struck or dropped. Here now is Fred Hutton joins us live here with the very latest. Well, Anthony, the jury first heard about the possibility of accidental discharge from Crown Prosecutor Mark Harima in his opening statement two weeks ago. Today, they heard from a firearms expert that the sawed-off 12-gauge shotgun in this case, which was recovered from a home on Kitty Vitty Road, went off several times during testing, even when the trigger wasn't pulled. 
Laura Knowles was the second witness from the RCMP's crime lab in Ottawa to testify at the trial. Now, the Crown actually brought in a 12-gauge shotgun to have Knowles demonstrate for the jury how the gun works. She also tested the actual gun that was recovered from the home on Kittivity Road. Knowles told the court that she conducted several tests on that sawed-off shotgun and, well, she said when she hit the gun with a rubber mallet with moderate force, it went off. She also said that the gun discharged when it was dropped to the floor from a distance of two feet. Now, last week, the defense pointed out that Larry Wellman used a table to push the gunman back in the pool room at the captain's quarters hotel. It was during that altercation the gun went off. Under cross-examination, Mark Rushi asked Knowles if she had concerns about the gun going off without pulling the trigger. She said yes, and she said she even contacted Winchester, the maker of the gun, by email to ask if any other customers had complained about similar guns going off accidentally when hit or dropped. She said she never received a reply from the company. Now, she also examined three pieces of wood that were discovered at the Captain's Quarters Hotel. Knowles concluded the three pieces fit together and were likely part of the gun seized by RNC investigators. Now, tomorrow, a DNA expert also from the RCMP's crime lab in Ottawa will be called to the stand to testify. Carolyn? Thanks, Fred. That's the CBC's Fred Hutton reporting live. Well, we have an update now on a story CBC Investigates first told you about more than three years ago. It's about someone a B.C. Supreme Court judge once called a con man. James Timothy Drummond was back in court today for a sentencing hearing. He had pleaded guilty to two counts of forgery back in April. Other counts of fraud were dropped. The CBC's Jen White was at Supreme Court today and she joins us now live from the newsroom. So, Jen, what are the details? Well, Carolyn, James Drummond was trying to buy two properties back in 2014, one for $650,000 and another for about $1.3 million. Now, he signed the purchase agreements under a different name, Tim Scott, but he never supplied a photo ID or the necessary deposits for those purchases. Now, he told the real estate agent at the time that he had terminal cancer with just a few months left to live. There were delays in getting the deposits from international funds as well as medical issues. Then in early 2015, a business partner sent an email saying Tim Scott had died, but that his estate wanted to go ahead with these purchases. Then about a month later, the real estate agent saw Tim Scott, AKA James Drummond, at the Dr. H. Bliss Murphy Cancer Center. That's when the jig was up. Today, both sides and the judge agreed that this is an unusual case. Crown Prosecutor Dana Sullivan is looking for five to six months in prison, which she, excuse me, which she calls a step up from his previous fraud convictions back here in 2016. Now, he served three months then for writing bad checks on a rental property. Meanwhile, the defense says there was no financial loss to the real estate agent nor the homeowner and no personal gain to Drummond and that he's 70 now on a long list of medications and that he's remorseful. Tammy Drover is asking for a conditional sentence of three months. Of course, this is not Drummond's first brush with the law. He has a prior conviction in BC for stealing money from the Boy Scouts Christmas tree fund. And it's not the first time he's actually falsely claimed someone has died. In BC, a judge called him a con man, saying he made up stories about dead relatives and overseas family trusts. Now, Drummond is due back in court in St. John's next week to hear the judge's decision. Carolyn. Thanks, Jen. That's the CBC's Jen White reporting live. Well, now to some sports news and uh, not a bad start for the St. John's Edge. The new basketball franchise scored its first ever win Saturday night in Charlottetown. It was especially memorable for hometown hero Carl English. He hit the winning three-point shot with just four seconds left in the game against PEI's Carl Island English Storm. The star recently four. signed Welcome to the edge to after playing in Europe Carl last English. year. He said his shooting was off on Saturday, but he was confident he'd be able to deliver in the end. I told the guys, don't worry, and I knew I was going to make it, and I shot it with confidence. And as I walked to the court, I told the ref what was about to happen. So I, I, I imagined this in my mind. I wish I had to start out better, but you know, all that matters, we got that win. And, the guys are super happy and we're on to the next one. I mean, I, I, this is my second day, so I'm, I'm, I'm messing up a lot of things. I don't know the plays. I, I'm, you know, I'm fitting in as, as best as I can, but, you know, we'll get more fluent as, as the games go on and we'll be ready, especially when we get back home. White is no longer the color of purity. How this artist is bringing color to one of Newfoundland's most famous food factories.
murders and bank robbery. Along the way, I was diagnosed with schizophrenia. I relapsed and went downtown, got on Paul Jobs. CBCNL steps inside the doors of the Wiseman Center, which provides temporary shelter, housing, support, and hope. Well, our philosophy here is that everyone is, first of all, persons. They're all people like you and I. Join us for our half-hour documentary on November 22nd on CBC TV. Welcome back. Jam jams, peppermint knobs, and probably the reddest syrup on the planet, not to mention hardtack. Most home kitchens in this province definitely have something from purity factories in them. An artist, originally from Mount Pearl, took on the task of immortalizing those foods on one of the factory's big walls. I'd like you to meet Don Short. What were you trying to achieve here? My achievement is to produce a very colorful mural in an open space so that we can engage the community to come down and take a look just to uh, just create something that's exciting, which is great. Why so big? Why so big? It's a big wall. <laughs> uh, it used to contain one third of a mural, but um, Purity decided that they would like the full, full impact and use the whole surface. So yeah, so bigger the better for me. Not, not often you get that large of a canvas. What's the challenge of being a muralist? Uh, time frames just to make sure I'm weather but I've been very fortunate very few days of cold or rain um, it's sort of my first introduction to outdoor work I've done a two or three out, outdoor murals so this is a learning experience as well on the left we have uh, the peppermint wave so basically this is a bakery which is a whole bunch of mayhem and crazy activity based on uh, what might not happen in the factory. So it's a very tongue in cheek and playful. So we wanted a peppermint wave where the pot spilled over and the baker is riding the wave like surfing. Uh, then we have purity syrup on a shelf, which is tipping over and um, very interested in the syrup sales. So she's catching the syrup in her cup. Uh, we have the workers riding the conveyor belt of cookies, which is awesome. Um, and the hub of the whole mural is the kitchen stove. So rather than do a factory stove, I, I put a bit of traditional reference in there. So we basically have the, you know, uh, the cloths, the old kettle, you know, the oven mitts, everything that has a traditional sort of Newfoundland feel. Who's the, who's the dude on the chandelier? The dude could be the boss. It could be uh, anyone in higher administration. So uh, he's having a, a bad day because he's trying to prevent the crow from taking the kisses, which is great, the rope of kisses. The challenge is uh, staying on top for lengthy periods of time. Uh, even though you create systems for balance and all that, um, you know when you need to come down. It's, sometimes it's just a little too much. So I just create a system of going top to bottom and taking breaks from the higher levels, because that's 40 feet. So it's pretty high. So what's the difference between painting, say, right on ground level and at the top part where the scaffolding would have been? Uh, wind factor. Seagulls, crows flying above you, not knowing they're coming. All those kind of situations, yeah. <laughs> What's your favorite aspect of being given the, the privilege or the work yeah. of completing a project like this? A lot of it is uh, that I get to showcase some of the skills that kind of lie dormant because people don't know that I do it. So there's graphic elements, there's the playful imagery, uh, all that kind of thing. Um, it's a pure pleasure of having a, a huge canvas that I can explore and you know, it was a great collaborative effort working with Purity. The, the main ideas were there, but I pulled the concept together around those ideas and add, contributed to it. Some of the mural is planned and other parts are um, reactive. So when I'm here, the crows and the seagulls were a big part of my life for the past four weeks. So I brought them into the mural story. So that's the fun part of being a muralist. I estimated four to six weeks. So it took four weeks. This is the final day and we have sunshine and the weather's been great. Well, I really appreciate you uh, here now coming today to uh, view the mural. Uh, it's interesting over the past four weeks working here, the community engagement that's been happening. And it's, it's a focal point in the area because it's so open, there's a big parking lot. So it, it basically has that open view. So uh, I just encourage anybody in the area to come down and take a look because it's very different in person. Yeah, it certainly is. It's worth checking out if you haven't been by there, if you're in the St. John's area. A very popular place to bring young kids to in a stroller. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to thank Ryan because he said he wasn't expecting to finish it on time, but we've had such a nice fall, oh, he, yeah. could, uh, he could actually paint. And I guess Ryan will be up in a few minutes to let us know mm -hmm. uh, if that nice weather is going to continue. I had everything to do with it. <laughs> <laughs>
by the Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 400 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can too. Well, here's a lovely shot sent to us by James Jones. So was it uh, part of a wharf, an old wharf? That's right. This was taken in Battle Harbor, I believe, back in the 40s, and uh, they're hauling in some seals. And you can see oh, there yeah. the picture. Uh, he notes, how about the pancake ice, which we talked oh, about right. last week. <laughs> oh, look. There it is. Circular stuff there. That's a nice old <laughs> shot with pancake ice, too. And, of course, dead seals. Lovely. <laughs> a Newfoundland picture. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so a uh, winter picture there, and uh, we've been talking about uh, Labrador is really, especially the west, yeah. I mean, winter is full on, no coming back. Yeah. Now, 40 centimeters last weekend, and then of course, Whoa. light snow pretty much all of last week, and then another 18 centimeters last night uh, in through this morning. It's beautiful. It wow. is. Wow. And Sheldon Tuck says, this is what it looks like in the old backyard uh, for a little spin on the quad. And yeah. what a picture there. Uh, thank you so much, Sheldon, for this uh, great picture, uh, great video that is. And uh, yeah, I mean, if you want winter, you got up, it there. there it head up to Lab West. <laughs> All the snowmobilers in the Avalon are salivating. <laughs> That's right. Wow. It's gorgeous, though. It is. It really is. And as we look at our highs today, just minus one in Labrador City. Really, that's where the cold air has been and stayed uh, across, of course, uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay and eastern parts uh, was the warm up and the rain on top of that snow that you had, uh, of course, earlier in the week. So a little bit of a slushy mess there, as I mentioned. How about temperatures on the island today into the double digits everywhere from Cornerbrook to Twillingate to St. John's? Not so much now. Back to one in Cornerbrook and five in Twilling Gate, eight in St. John's. We're going to continue to see those temperatures drop. Minus seven now in Labrador City. And we're down to three degrees in Happy Valley Goose Bay. We'll actually continue to see temperatures fall tonight and through the day tomorrow in Happy Valley Goose Bay as this colder air wraps in on the other side of the system. Still some pretty breezy winds out there. Sustained near 50 right now in uh, Stephenville. And along that west coast, that's where the wind is really going to be... Uh, uh, Staying an issue tonight in through tomorrow with those snow squalls firing up. As I mentioned earlier, the rain clearing off from the Avalon, just a little bit of lingering drizzle over the next little bit. It's the onshore flurries that have already developed for the West Coast, and those become a little more squall like, which is where we see these these bands, these narrow bands of snow set up where you're driving along and it's sunny and fine. And then next thing you know, it's a complete whiteout and then you could drive another five minutes and it's gone again. So that's the nature of the beast for tomorrow morning, at least as where we have the, the better chance of seeing some of those squalls. Onshore flurries though, uh, in the mix there as well as that's kind of the old setup from the onshore flow. Winds gusting to 50. Uh, you can see where winds will gust to 60 kilometers per hour early on tomorrow in western Labrador with a minus 14 temperature. Wind chills well into the minus 20s there. So bundle those kids up warm to start the day there. Again, driving, uh, keep an eye on those squalls along the west coast. The Buren Peninsula and the Avalon tomorrow morning may see a, a flurry or shower so uh, early on, so keep that in mind as well. Winds will gust uh, likely in the 40 to 50 kilometer per hour range. Note those uh, squalls taper off into the afternoon. Still a lingering chance of a flurry along the west coast. Everybody else is pretty quiet. The wind's still a little on the breezy side. 60, even some 70 kilometer per hour wind gusts. Sun and cloud developing for basically the eastern half of the island. Those flurries will start to taper off along the west coast. The temperatures near the freezing mark will fall from minus 2 to minus 6 in Happy Valley Goose Bay. And there's that sunshine developing into the afternoon uh, for the southeast. Minus 10 for highs in western Labrador. Tonight through tomorrow, we're talking about the possibility of 5 to as much as 10 centimeters of snow. Anywhere from Grossmore and Cornerbrook down into the Bay St. George area. So keep that in mind. Uh, enough to certainly dust off the car and shovel off the walkways. Now as we roll into the Wednesday time period, pretty quiet. Increase in clouds on the island. Our next system starting to roll into western parts of Labrador with some snow. Temperatures near minus 2. We're really starting to warm up. Note where we're into that southerly flow. We're going to see temperatures rising into the five, six, seven, eight degree range. That's on the leading edge of this next system, which will be a big snowmaker. It appears for the north to mid coast and back to Happy Valley Goose Bay and Churchill Falls. And this is going to be a rain and wind event for the island for Wednesday night in through Thursday. We'll flirt with the double digits again. And again, talking about the possibility of some big snow for Goose Bay. And we'll talk about that in more detail with your long range forecast in just a few minutes, Anthony. 7-8. 
We're going to examine why the ocean's changing temperature creates uncertainty for crab fishermen. A big person's pond boil-up in part two of It's Worth the Drive. Sunday at 12.30 and Monday at 7. Well, crab fishermen are heading into the winter with one big burning question, and that is, will they have more cuts to the amount of crab they're allowed to catch? To talk about that, I'm joined by Jane Aidy. She, of course, is host of the broadcast on CBC Radio 1. Good to see you. You too. So maybe to start with, Jane, we should talk a bit about some of the problems uh, with shellfish over the season. Yeah, so I'd like to remind people, uh, scientists say that one of the biggest problems is that the temperature of the ocean is changing off our coast. It's getting quite warm, and that's not good for shellfish like crab and shrimp. It's not good for our economy either. I think last year the landed value of crab was somewhere around $275 million. So Jane, what do we know about the outlook for crab for next season? Well, we don't actually know the scientific answers to those questions yet, but the research that was done to arrive at that science uh, was actually just completed out on the water, and I had a chance to go on board a research vessel called the Vladikov mm -hmm. uh, earlier in the fall to see that science being done firsthand. Take a look. So that'd be kind of our first commercially desirable one there. Daryl Maloney is a biologist with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Fish harvesters in this province would know him as the crab guy. For the last three to four years, he's been the lead on crab research. Maloney invited journalists to come along on one of the last crab surveys of the year to see firsthand how science is done to determine the health of the stock. Biologists measure and record the widest part of the shell and the widest part of the crab claw. It's all in an effort to see just how old the crab is in the ocean and if there are many young ones on the way. We started down in Fortune Bay at the end of May, and since then we've done about eight bays around the province uh, up until now. So we've been quite busy at it, roughly about 75 days at sea. Uh, we hauled one set today. We've done about 200, 225 of those this year, measured about 35,000 crabs, and that work entailed 12 uh, technicians and scientists uh, from our science branch. 278. 278. And that's a good, this is a, this is a keepable crab too, but. Let's talk about what you're seeing. 
What we're seeing is an old shelled stock of crab. Um, we're seeing a lack of recruitment. By recruitment, I mean crabs that will become available to the fishery in the next year or two. Uh, we're not seeing any young crabs in the population. So uh, at all sizes, small and large crabs, we're seeing this old shelled stock, uh, kind of analogous somewhat to the population of the province, I suppose, with people in the, in the old yes, shelled population. Yeah. Everybody knows that this this is, I guess, cause for great concern among harvesters. Uh, I guess over the last few years there have been cuts and, and people like you have had to deliver that kind of news. But uh, certainly this year, no real bright spot. There doesn't appear to be, on the broad scale, a whole lot of bright spots right now. And I'm, I mean, our best outlook is two to three years away. Uh, in our biggest area here in 3 LNO, the Grand Bank, there's particularly doesn't seem to be a whole lot uh, in the short term. That's not to say there aren't small crabs in the water that will benefit the fishery in the future, but certainly in the biggest areas, it looks uh, pretty bleak right now. That said, there are actually a few bright spots. Uh, our surveys in 3K to the north this year uh, were looking a little bit better overall than we've seen in a few years. Last year, the crab fishery was cut anywhere from 13 to 20 percent, and that followed cuts from the year before. I always think about people like you after I hear the announcements about quota cuts, <laughs> uh, because you're the guy who has to sit down with harvesters and break the really tough news to them. What is that like? You know, um, it's not fun. Uh, I wish that I could walk in there with good news and, and every year and tell everybody that uh, the state of the stock was good. It can be tough, there's no doubt about it, and it, it can uh, affect you, um, but it has to be done. I take pride in the fact that we have been able to tell people that this is happening or this is forthcoming. Uh, despite delivering bad news, I'm glad that we've been able to deliver accurate news. How would you describe the reaction that you get from harvesters when you do break the bad news? Are they in disbelief? Are they in denial? Or are they preparing for the inevitable? It's a bit of both. Um, I get a real mixed bag of some harvesters who say, yeah, this is what we're seeing, uh, or some harvesters who will come up and say something like, listen, we didn't believe you two years ago, but now it's, it's here, and thank you for telling me. And then we get the others who are just upset in the short term and maybe acting on a bit of emotion, that kind of thing. Uh, so it's a real mixed bag of reactions. Maloney will spend the winter analyzing this year's findings. Late February, the stock assessment is compiled. In March, he'll head out on the road to talk to harvesters about what he's seen. Maloney says he knows how important his work is to fishers. They need to know the truth about what the future of this lucrative fishery will be. It's a big fishery. Um, this has been the world's largest crab fishery for quite some time. Uh, and I'm very proud to be uh, at the helm of the science program for it. Jane Aidy, CBC News, Conception Bay. That's really interesting. It, it is, science. very interesting, yeah. Kind of a downer though, I gotta say, because uh, I don't know about you, I almost feel guilty watching Jane's item because I really enjoy eating those things. I have to <laughs> review my diet, I suppose, because it's kind of it's kind of upsetting to see that the all the predictions about the demise of the crab seem to be coming true. Yeah, well at least the crab harvesters will be happy to hear you say that you enjoy it. Probably, yeah. yeah. <laughs> coming up next, we'll tell you where and when these big animals brought traffic to a bit of a halt. A lot of them.
time now to meet our young athlete of the day. We'd like to introduce 11-year-old Nathan Daw of St. John's. Nathan curls with the Valley Haley Country Club and the Remax Center. And in the offseason, he sails with the Royal Newfoundland Yacht Club. Ah, nice. Congratulations, Nathan. You're today's young athlete of the day. And here's a beautiful shot sent to us by Michelle Valerie Cram. That's a big one. That is total wow. bow. Now, is the pot of gold in the sea or on the land? <laughs> it's in the sea for sure. <laughs> it's been one of those nights it probably could be. Yes. <laughs> what a fantastic picture. Beautiful. Now, Ryan, before we get to the weather, I want to talk to you about the kind of traffic obstacle that we don't often see here in St. John's. And uh, Carolyn alluded to that before the break. I don't mm -hmm. think we actually, I don't think I've ever seen it. No, no. I mean, you, you see moose, the odd moose every once in a while and uh, other small animals. But just have a look at this. Now that. And just a few. Beautiful. Yep, Caribou Crossing on the Burgio Highway. This uh, video was sent in to us by Lee Pedal, uh, and he spotted this last week. It's pretty impressive, especially all the reports you get about the demise of the of caribou. It's nice to see so many of them. Yeah, it is. And not, you know, too close to the cars. They're such great animals. Oh, they're beautiful. Fabulous. Thank you very much for sending that video in. It was sweet. Yeah, it is. Very nice. Uh, and as you can see, no snow there, but no. uh, a little taste of snow in that neck of the woods. Uh, in fact, uh, most of the western half of the island has a pretty good chance to see at least some flurries over the next 24 hours or so. Uh, let's have a look at our uh, weather on the way headlines. Snow squalls for the west coast, onshore flurries in the mix of some more big snow for Labrador. We'll talk about that rain and wind for the island with more mild temps. And uh, at one point today, St. John's was the warmest spot in Canada. Now, Vancouver and southern BC has now since beat us out as they move into their afternoon. But look at the cold air. It's really dominating from Alberta right down into southern Ontario. Montreal at minus six right now. And again, this low that's moving through into the Great Lakes, not so much of a concern for us. It's this low here that's moving onto the west coast. That'll be that snowmaker that I talked about for Labrador as it holds hands with some moisture coming in from the south over the next couple of days. Uh, this again, our most recent low is moving off. And as we roll through tonight, we'll see those onshore flurries and snow squalls develop over the west coast. Chances some of those flurries into metro for tomorrow morning. Lingering flurries are the name of the game across Labrador tomorrow as temperatures will again fall in Happy Valley Goose Bay. It's a pretty cool day across Labrador and even across the island. Low single digits, but a bit of sunshine in the mix after those onshore flurries start to taper off into the Wednesday time period. Snow starting to roll in. It's light for Western Labrador, but yes, another little bit there. The island will see some increase in clouds on Wednesday, but it's dry. And then our next system moves in Wednesday night in through Thursday. Some pretty gusty winds here, I think, along the west coast, the south coast of the island. And it's going to be, again, the track dependent, but rain in the southeast, snow to the back side of this low. And right now I'm leaning towards an all or mostly snow event for Happy Valley Goose Bay and then up towards the mid to north coast of Labrador. This will be a significant snowmaker. Thursday afternoon, those periods of rain, even at times heavy, will be starting to march across the island. Not quite guaranteed that we'll be into some of those double digits, but we'll certainly be close. There's a quick look again at the next three, eight, nine degrees on the island with that rain moving west to east on Thursday. And again, that snow in Labrador, that's going to be an interesting one. This is the latest European forecast model, and you can see where it is laying down a solid swath here of 20 to 30 plus centimeters. And again, 30 potential for certainly for Happy Valley Goose Bay up towards the north coast by the time we get to the end of Thursday and that low starts to move off and we see the snow tapering to flurries. Note that first low moves off for Friday. Yeah, some lingering flurries, certainly a cool down into the long range forecast. Right now, Saturday looks like a pleasant day on the island with our next system moving into Labrador. And how about the track of these next couple of systems? Well to the west, yet another warm up into the long range for uh, the Monday, Sunday into Monday time period. And so, yeah, no sign of old man winter coming and staying on the island. That's for sure. We've got again flurry chances, certainly tomorrow. Back in the mix for the Friday time period, but that warm air keeps coming back for another stay into Sunday, Monday. And there you can see in Labrador a much different story, especially in the West. Old man winter, he's got his feet up on the coffee table. He's not going anywhere. That's your forecast to now.
Thanks, Ryan. Well, Mothers Against Drunk Driving and the RNC launched their annual red ribbon campaign today. Police officers are going to be wearing red laces for the next six weeks as part of the Lace Up for Mad campaign. As we know, Project Red Ribbon is geared to bring awareness and to help in the fight against impaired driving. And of course, we can't do that without our police officers, our first responders. These are the people who make a difference for us. They're the ones who are on the roadways. They're the ones who have to go to a crash, see the carnage firsthand, live with this nightmare, and then they have to go home to our homes and tell us that our loved one is no longer here. This is something they carry with them every single day. Lacing up your boots, wearing our red pins, sharing our red ribbon. Make sure you don't go home today without one. Bring it home with you. Bring it to your families, bring it to your friends, bring it to your neighbors. And make sure that everyone's responsible so that we do not have to lose another Newfoundland and Labradorian this year. We do not have to lose another Canadian. So that we don't have to have any more of these events, so that we don't have to light another candle to honor somebody. It remains an alarming fact that on average four people die every day in Canada and approximately 175 are injured in drug and alcohol related crashes. And despite all of the efforts that have been made in so many areas, this still remains the number one criminal cause of death in our country. During the upcoming holiday season and in the days ahead, MAD Newfoundland and Labrador chapters and community leaders remind everyone to have a safe plan for a ride home Stay all night, call a cab if that service is available in your community, have a designated driver, and a reminder always, especially to our young people, please do not get in a vehicle with anyone who has been drinking or doing drugs and driving. We don't want there to be an empty place at the dinner table this Christmas season. Well, turning now to national and international news, 1960s cult figure turned California lifer Charles Manson has died. Manson was a wannabe musician in his 30s when he was arrested in connection with the now infamous Tate LaBianca murders in Hollywood. In 1971, he was found guilty and sentenced to death for directing his drug-dazed followers to commit the crimes. The sentence was commuted to life, and that's what he served early on. Manson carved an X into his forehead, refashioning it as a swastika, calling it a symbol of how being locked up changed him. Charles Manson died after being hospitalized for an undisclosed health problem last week. He was 83 years old. Well, bells pealed for three hours today at Westminster Abbey in honor of the 70th wedding anniversary of Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip. The Mountbatten Windsors. Of the bells. They were married at the Abbey in 1947, just two years after the end of the Second World War. Royalty and officials from around the world attended the lavish ceremony. The Royal Mail has now issued a series of commemorative stamps, and Buckingham Palace has released a new portrait of the royal couple. There they are. Uh, Elizabeth, as well as being the longest reigning queen, has another record. She is the longest married British monarch. Our beautiful viewer picture of the day. This one uh, picked out by Mr. Germain. Ah, oh, nice yeah, it's a beauty. Pick. It is. Yeah, it sh uh, shows off my taste. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, your clue this is somewhere on the Avalon. Guess where? Oh. After the break.
Welcome back to Here Now. A quarter century of sporting history comes to a crashing finale. Yes, tell me about it. The Georgia Dome in Atlanta has been imploded. There it wow. goes. Took about 12 seconds and a little over 2,200 kilos of explosives. Since opening in 1992, it hosted the Atlanta Summer Olympics, two Super Bowls, and a trio of uh, Final Fours. Yes, it's been replaced by the more than a billion and a half dollar Mercedes-Benz Stadium, which opened in the summer and stands just meters from the dome itself. As for the rubble, that's going to be cleared to make way for a hotel. Quite the blast. Yes. The Santa Claus Parade rolled through downtown Toronto yesterday. Of course, that's the time of year's Yeah, it's a time-honored holiday tradition that takes over the streets of the city to delight crowds of uh, folks just eager to see the big guy in the red suit. Crowds in the thousands line the route. Taking in a spectacle that included 28 floats, 21 bands, and a whole lot of Christmas cheer. This was the 113th year for the annual parade. Of course, the big question we have now after seeing this is uh, what will the weather hold for this Sunday's downtown Christmas parade in St. John's? And uh, I guess we can sort of get to that. I have one big question for Ryan Snodden coming up, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How are you going to march in the parade this yeah, year? Yeah, I don't. Oh. I got to figure something out. I can't really walk in the parade. What and about it, crutches? Uh, Would that help you or? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Uh, that's a long way to go on crutches <laughs> too. Uh, by the way, as we look at the, our picture of the day, real quick, uh, this one taken as I mentioned on the Avalon. You can see on the way to Long Harbor. Oh. On the, on the road to Long Harbor is where this was taken by Bev Bruce and a beautiful shot there. Thanks very nice. much, Bev. Excellent. Uh, timing will be everything for our weekend system moving in on Sunday. Of course, that's uh, parade day, so we're uh, keeping our fingers crossed. We'll, we'll watch that. And yeah, until then, we're going to figure out something to do. <laughs> we're going to push you around. <laughs> Your fingers crossed. Good night, everyone. Good night. See you tomorrow.